Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series has been a very interesting one entitled Preparation for the End Time. This is lesson number 13, the last lesson in this series for June 30 of 2018, entitled The Return of Our Lord Jesus. Wow. So um, this will prove to be a great lesson in, 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 for a number of reasons. And so we'd like to ask you to pay special attention as we will try to do as well. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, as we think about this most wonderful event of all time, the return of our wonderful Savior and Lord, may we learn from this lesson things that will help us to prepare as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, are we happy to know that the great controversy, the greatest war of all time, had a beginning and because it will have an end? Our name is interesting, Seventh-day Adventist. It reflects beginnings and endings. What do, we, what do we mean by that? When we celebrate on the seventh day, the Sabbath on the seventh day, what are we looking back to? Creation. Creation, Creation the beginning of life on this earth. And when we talk about being Adventist, what are we looking forward to? Yes. The second the coming. The, the second coming of Jesus. So we've got a name that encompasses the full history of, well, wickedness, really, humanity here on this earth uh, from beginning to end, bookends, if you will. Now, of course, that's not quite true. Where did the great controversy really start? Heaven. heaven. Started in heaven. But very quickly it came down to this earth. And how did it get into our, our, our system? Adam and Eve, through that Adam's sin. frightful time when Eve and Adam ate the fruit. Well, so now talking about the advent, the second advent, the second coming of, of Jesus. Um, where do we mostly read about that in the Bible? Revelation. Most of it's in the New Testament. There's a lot of it in the New Testament. Is there any in the Old Testament? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, where would we look in the Old Testament to find some? Isaiah, what else? Okay, let's look at a few passages. Look at Isaiah 13, 6 and 9. Howl in pain, the day of the Lord is near, the day when the Almighty brings destruction. Does that sound like the first coming or the second coming? Hmm. Well, I'll drop the Jews wanted it to be the first coming. Yeah. First coming. Drop down to verse 9. The day of the Lord is coming, that cruel day <coughs> of his fierce anger and fury. The earth will be made a wilderness and every sinner will be destroyed. Well, that clearly is not talking about the first coming as we know it, right? Look at Zechariah. Could be the third even. What? Could be the third coming even. Yeah. Look at Zechariah 14, verse 9. Then the Lord will be king over all the earth, and everyone will worship him as God and know him by the same name. Does that sound like what happened at the first coming? No. That'll be second coming or maybe even third coming, right? And finally, Daniel 12, verse 1. The angel wearing linen clothes said, At that time the great angel Michael who guards your people will appear. Then there will be a time of troubles, the worst since nations first came into existence. When that time comes, all the people of your nation whose names are written in God's book will be saved. What time is that talking about? Second coming. Second coming, isn't it? Now we understand those things clearly. So Fred has already told us. What, what did the Jews think these passages referred to? They thought somehow well, all this was going to happen at the first coming, didn't they? At the coming. At the coming, the yeah. Coming. So what does this expression, the day of the Lord, mean? Well, Joel, isn't every day God's day? Well, the day that God shows up to put all things right. Oh, Okay. Joel has got, yeah, I got power, right? four references or more yeah. of his. <laughs> Several of them in Joel, yeah. yeah. 
it's for the destruction of the Almighty and uh, the dead Lord is coming, it is near. Earthquake before them, sun and moon and stars. The day of the Lord is great and terrible. Who can endure it? There's a very interesting passage that's not mentioned in our, in our Bible study guide, but I think this is one of the clearest passages. It's found in Isaiah 33. Look at verse 10 and on. The Lord says to the nations, Now I will act. I will show how powerful I am. You make worthless plans and everything you do is useless. My spirit is like a fire that will destroy you. Hmm, my spirit is like a fire that will destroy you? You will crumble like rocks burnt to make lime, like thorns burnt to ashes. Let everyone near and far hear what I have done and acknowledge my power. How would you respond if God spoke to you like that? Well, the sinful people of Zion are trembling with fright. They say God's judgment is like a fire that burns forever. Can any of us survive a fire like that? Okay, now's the question. You can survive if you say and do what is right. Don't use your power to cheat the poor. Don't accept bribes. Don't join with those who plan to commit murder or to do other evil things. Then you will be safe. You will be as secure as if you were in a strong fortress. You will have food to eat and water to drink. So, who is frightened? No, we the unrighteous. The unrighteous. And what's going to happen to the righteous? They live in the fire. They live in the fire. That's amazing. This is God's, God's spirit, well, God's presence, right? Well, his glory, which is his character. Mm -hmm. You live in his presence. Uh, you're no more confusion. You're living in a state of confusion. So, from, from my study, uh, the fire is always the destruction of anything that's evil, including mm -hmm. false messages. And this is what it's all about, getting rid of everything that is false in our religions, mm -hmm. not just our own. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it yeah. did say it was like a fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. there's a lot of opening there yeah. for interpretation. Mm -hmm. So um, <coughs> there's some interesting verses here. What do you think is implied by this? Look at Philippians 4, verse 3. And you too, my faithful partner, I want you to help these women, for they have worked hard with, it, with me to spread the gospel, together with Clem and all other fellow believers, whose names are in God's book of the living. Hmm. Well, let's look at some other passages. Revelation 3, verse 5. Those who win the victory would be clothed like this in white, and I will not remove their names from the book of the living. In the presence of the Father and so forth, as his angels, etc. The book of the living. And Revelation 13, verse 8. All people living on earth will worship it, except those whose names are written before the creation of the world in the book of the living, which belongs to the Lamb that was killed. Before the creation of the world, God knew who was going to be saved and who. Is this predestination? That's a reference to God's foreknowledge. Okay. Well, if God's fierce anger and fierce whatever is going to fall on some to his faithful followers, it will be the time of protection and safety. I've said before, and I'm going to say it again now, and I want you to think about it out there. One of the things that's probably least understood from the Bible is how sin affects us. There's, I, would, I would even call it a gap. Maybe I haven't read it carefully enough, but... Why is it that Adam and Eve could walk with God comfortably and friendly in the Garden of Eden, but we come down to the days of Moses even, and he, God says, if you see me, it, it'll, you'll perish. What happened? Did our flesh change? Did, what, what's different? Our will became corrupted and resisted. So that has something to do with fire retardation? <laughs> that, well, it has to do with... Uh, it's, it's like plugging uh, a toaster, 110 toaster, into a 210 socket, you know. Oh. If, if we come close to God and we uh, resist, uh, we can be consumed much as uh, we just get overloaded because our, our will creates resistance. Okay, and I'm not arguing with that, but clearly a 210 toaster would do just fine. And some people are going to do fine in God's presence, and some people are not going to do fine in God's presence. And what's the difference? Will we be able to see, oh yeah, I can see you, you're, you're going to be fine. No, you're going to, be, you're going to burn up. What's the difference? What happens to us? It, 
our will becomes softened and, and able to, so that we can say, I delight to do thy will, that ye thy law is within my heart. Um, so God's going to come along and put fireproof on somebody and then he's going to do well, something no, it's the opposite? Well, no, it's a process of coming to know him. We, be, By beholding yes. him, we become changed. And as we become changed, we uh, are able to approach closer and closer until we can see him as he is. You know, if, if, I, if I loved him, couldn't stand you. Mm -hmm. If I was next to you, it would be like a fire to me because I mm. couldn't stand you. To me, I think that's what it's talking about. And during that time when the Lord comes, the Lord will be all over the place. And well, these people will be in a place where they can't stand it. Mm -hmm. Well, we, we read in Revelation 6, they're going to be calling for the rocks and hills to fall on them, aren't they? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A friend of mine said, the same fire melts butter and cures or bakes the clay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it's, it's what the, we are like yeah. that makes the determination. That's one I, I want to know how do you change from, from, from clay to butter? From butter, <laughs> butter to clay, you so mean? Uh, yeah, from butter to clay, yeah. Yeah, whatever this the word. fire is, um, your flesh can be the same as mine, but it'll burn somebody's flesh and not mine. There's Look going to be something different yeah. about it. Look at Matthew 24, verses 30 and 31. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The great trumpet will sound, and he will send out his angels to the four corners of the earth, and they will gather his chosen people from one end of the world to the other. Are they weeping out of joy or weeping out of anger? Well... One thing I think we can say for sure is those who are God's enemies are moving further and further away from him, and those who are God's friends are trying to get as close as they can to him. I, I think that's one thing we can be sure about. Um, those whose names are in the book of life mm -hmm. are those who have understood that he is the way and the truth. He's the way to the truth that gives life. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's a matter of following Jesus. Yeah. And that is acceptance of the message he came to this earth to provide us with. So that's the way we can make sure that we're on the right side when this whole thing comes to an end. So this means every day we must, we must choose to follow God's guidance for our lives. Well, it should be clear from what we read in the New Testament that the Jews in Jesus' day were hoping that the Messiah would come and help them defeat the Romans. They were sure that Israel would be the most powerful nation in the world under the Messiah. But we now know that the coming of Jesus, neither in his first coming nor his second coming, will accomplish that. It's not the purpose of coming as a military leader to make them somehow the all-powerful nation. In fact, God has a much better plan for those who follow him. So how different will things be when God comes again? Well, look at these verses. We mentioned these last week, but let's look at them very carefully now. Daniel 2, look at 34 and 35 first. While you are looking at it, now that's this is, the, this is that statue made of gold and silver and bronze and iron and feet of iron and clay. While you were looking at it, a great stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it, struck the iron and clay feet of the statue and shattered them. At once the iron, clay, bronze, silver and gold crumbled and became like the dust on a threshing place in summer. What happens to the dust in a threshing place? It's blown oh. away. The wind carried it all away, leaving not a trace, but the stone grew to be a mountain that covered the whole earth. So then we go back and we look at verses 44 and 45. At that time, at the time of those rulers, the God of heaven will establish a kingdom that will never end. It will never be conquered, but will completely destroy all those empires and then last forever. You saw how a stone broke loose from a cliff without anyone touching it, 
and how it struck the statue made of iron, bronze, clay, silver, and gold. The great God is telling your majesty what will happen in the future. I have told you exactly what you dreamt and have given you its true meaning. So, we remember those four kingdoms. Um, we remember that Rome itself finally broke up into the nations of modern Europe. But as we read in the dream of Nebuchadnezzar, which was interpreted by Daniel, we discover that things end in a remarkable and spectacular way. The old heavens and the old earth will be completely replaced by a new heaven and a new earth under the control of God and Christ. In fact, in Luke 20, verses 17 and 18, let's look at that real quick. Jesus looked at them and asked, What then does this scripture mean? The stone which the builders rejected as worthless turned out to be the most important of all. Everyone who falls on that stone will be cut to pieces. And if that stone falls on someone, it will crush him to dust. And who or what is that stone? Christ, Christ. Christ himself. Jesus himself identified himself with the stone that will crush to powder all that is left of this world. Furthermore, reading on in Daniel 2, the four nations that had been so powerful at one time will become like the dust on a threshing floor in summer. The wind carried it all away, leaving not a trace, Daniel 2.35. In other words, the old world order and the ways in which nations have conquered other nations will become a thing of the past. So this new nation is going to be under whose control? God's. Yeah. Christ. Christ. This is, this is God's kingdom. So let us carefully evaluate the situation. Remember that there are only two sides in this controversy, right? Ultimately, each of us will be totally committed to one side or the other. We can live forever with Jesus, with the Father, and with the Holy Spirit, or we will die and perish eternally. Well, look at a reference for that. Re Re Titus 2, verses 12 and 13. That grace instructs us to give up ungodly living and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this world. As we wait for the blessed day we hope for, when the glory of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ will appear. He gave himself for us to rescue us from the wicked and so forth and so forth. So, what is our blessed hope? Second coming, the second of Jesus. coming of right. Jesus. Especially those of us who've lost loved ones. We'd love to see the day when those people come up out of the ground again or come up from wherever they're buried and <coughs> join us to, to ascend to heaven. <coughs> well, there are a lot of people who don't like this idea. There's an evolutionary teacher was once lecturing to a crowd, and he's explaining that about, about 13 billion years ago, an infant, these are his words, open quote, an infinitely dense, tiny mass popped out of nothing, and that mass exploded. And from that explosion, our universe came into existence. Of course, he didn't explain how that infinitely dense, tiny mass could just pop out of nothing. He assumed that we were going to accept his word on faith. Oh dear, mm. I thought that's a bad word. But that's what he was asking, wasn't it? Accept my word because I say so. By contrast, the biblical concept of how we got started and the story of our first parents <coughs> is much easier to understand. In light of what we read in the Bible, our future hope is so much brighter. <coughs> and what is that future hope all about? What was Paul talking about? What did he? And this is in Second Timothy. We're looking at Second Timothy four six to eight. And where was Paul? What was he doing at this point in time? He's in prison. Yeah. In prison in the Mamertine prison in Rome, awaiting what? Execution. execution. His execution. What did he say? As for me, the hour has come for me to be sacrificed. The time is here for me to leave this life. I have done my best in the race. I have run the full distance, and I have kept the faith. 
And now there is waiting for me the victory prize of being put right with God, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day, and not only to me, but to all those who wait with love for him to appear. Okay. So what, what's Paul really saying to us there? These walls, uh, I don't know, how, have some of you been to the Mamertine prison in Rome? Yes, I have. Several of us have. Good. It's not a very pleasant place. You've got solid stone all around you, stone on the bottom, stone on the top. In, in Paul's day, there was one tiny little hole at the top and a gutter uh, leaping through a little hole at the bottom, and that was it. And there's no way you could get up to that hole on the top and climb out. It's up there way too high. And Paul knew that any day, any moment, a soldier could appear and say, come with me. It's time for you to be killed, to be beheaded, have your head cut off. And yet Paul had these marvelous words to say, probably working through a, a translator, and I don't, I mean, a, I'm sorry, a, scribe of some kind. I don't know whether he was standing up above and listening down through the hole and writing. I don't know exactly how that worked. Fortunately now they have, they've, carved, they've carved a stairway down so you can, you can walk down into the place. Wow. He knew, Paul knew that a crown of righteousness was waiting for him in heaven. Could it be possible for us in our day to have that same confidence? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Christians, especially Seventh-day Adventist Christians, have been clearly instructed on the importance and overarching truths of the great controversy. The truth about God, his character, and his government are what give meaning to everything for us. So are there consistent beliefs about the second coming among all Christian groups? Do all Christians agree on what's going to happen at the second coming? No. no. Not at all. What are some of the ideas? Do you remember? There's some Christian groups who are already trying to establish headquarters over in Jerusalem. Why are they doing that? We're going to get better and better and eventually Jesus we'll is rule. Jesus is going to come down and rule the world from Jerusalem. Okay? That's a pretty popular idea. There are other people who believe that somehow or other we're just, the whole world is going to get better. And then it'll, it'll be possible for God to come and bless us all. So what do you see as you look around in the world around you? Does it seem like everything is just getting better and better? No. Hardly. <laughs> Hardly? <laughs> well, look at some passages. Matthew 24, verse 30. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of earth will weep as they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Why are they weeping? Because what they wanted to happen is coming to an end. Things are in pretty bad shape. There will be a shout of command. This is 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 6. There will be a shout of command, the archangel's voice, the sound of God's trumpet. The Lord himself will come down from heaven. Those who have died believing in Christ will rise to life first. So there's a given sequence. Look at Matthew 26, 64. Jesus answered him, So you say, but I tell all of you, from this time on you will see the Son of Man sitting on the right, al right of the Almighty and coming on the clouds of heaven. Wow. Does that mean the Father and the Son are going to come down together? The right hand of the Almighty? Well, reading on, these verses make it very clear that the second coming of Jesus will be visible all over the world. Everyone will see him. And where do we get that verse? First, Revelation 1, verse 7. Look, he's coming in the clouds. Everyone will see him, including those who pierced him. All peoples on earth will mourn over him. So shall it be. So are they all going to see him on live television? Well, that's a question. Ellen White comments about the second coming in these words. Yes, in great controversy, 
page uh, 637, she gives a description. The firmament appears to open and shut. The glory of the throne of God seems flashing through. The mountains shake like a reed in the wind, and ragged rocks are scattered on every side. There is a roar as a coming tempest. The sea is lashed into fury. There is heard the shriek of a hurricane like the voice of demons upon a mission of destruction. The whole earth heaves and swells like the waves of the sea. Its surface is breaking up. Its very foundations seem to be giving way. Mountain chains are uh, sinking. Inhabited islands disappear. The seaports that have become like Sodom for the wickedness are swallowed up by the angry waters. Babylon the Great has come in remembrance before God to give unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. This wow. is taken from Revelation 16, 19. And Great Controversy 637. So when the second coming takes place, will anyone else really, will anything else really matter? No. Not at that point. How can we be sure that we are on the right side when that happens? Today is the day of salvation. We start here. Could it happen in our lifetimes? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, look at an example right taken from the Bible. John chapter 11 is, is basically the story of, of Jesus raising Lazarus to, to life. And we don't have time to review the whole story, but Jesus was on the other side of the Jordan over in Gentile territory. And now he, they, they go and they call him. And what does he do? He was, does he rush over back to Bethany? No, he delays, doesn't he? He delays. And finally, when he gets there, how many days have gone by? Four days. Four days. Lazarus has been dead four days. So Jesus says to his sister, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me will live even though they die. What does that mean? Well, the sister said, yeah, we know. Yeah, we believe that you're going to raise people from the dead sometime in the future. And Jesus said, no. I'm going to do something right now. And then, so what does he do? He says, take the stone away in verse 39, Jesus ordered. Martha, the dead man's sister, answered, there will be a bad smell, Lord. He's been buried four days. Are you glad that verse is in the Bible? Yes. He stinketh. Why are we glad it's there? We know he was really dead and in, in a state of decomposition, which means that Jesus literally had to recreate him. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so he, Jesus assured her that he himself was, was and is the resurrection and the life. Even when people die, that is not the end of their lives. Now, I would like you out there to picture in your mind what's happening here. This is, a, this is a cave, I mean, this is a burial site that's basically a cave in the side of a, of a hill. And Lazarus is buried in there. It's covered up with a stone. And Jesus is coming there. And how many people from Jerusalem are there? Many. Hmm? Many. Many. What kind of people do you think? Mourners. The rich and famous. The, the rich, yeah. A lot of rich and famous people because we know that Simon, who was Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' uncle, was a Pharisee. Pharisee. So there's going to be a lot of Pharisees there. Do you think there might be some Sadducees there too? Of course. Absolutely. And what did the Sadducees believe? There's no resurrection. There's no resurrection. Can you imagine what the, how they felt as they stood and waiting? What's he going to do now? What's he going to do now? Hmm. Well, Jesus spoke the word, and what happened? Lazarus came forth. 
So we know that even if we die, that's not the end for us. Even everyone who has ever lived will be raised to life again at either at the second coming or the third coming, John 5, 28 and 29. But the fact that Jesus died and rose again in his own power is our guarantee that we can live again. I find it uh, interesting that in the story of Lazarus, Jesus asked the humans to roll the stone. In other words, humans have their part to play. He will take care of the resurrection, but humans have to move that stone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, could he have moved the stone? Of course. Just as easy as anything. But he said, no, I want you to do that. I wonder who did it. So what's going to happen to the righteous dead when Jesus returns? It shall rise first. Where'd you get that? First Thessalonians four. Yeah, four. First Thessalonians four. Look at a couple of other verses. Romans six five. For since we have become one with him and dying as he did, in the same way we shall be one with him by being raised to life as he was. Raised to life as he was. First Thessalonians 4, 16, we've already read. Look at 1 Corinthians 15, 42 and 44. This is how it will be when the dead are raised to life. When the body is buried, it is mortal. When raised, it will be immortal. When buried, it is ugly and weak. When raised, it will be beautiful and strong. When buried, it is a physical body. When raised, it will be a spiritual body. There is, of course, a physical body, so there has to be a spiritual body. For the scripture says the first man, Adam, was created a living being and so forth. I'm going to drop down here. Um, to verse um, 51 and 52. Listen to this secret truth. We shall not all die, but when the last trumpet sounds, we shall all be changed in an instant, as quickly as the blinking of an eye. For when the trumpet sounds, the dead will be raised, never to die again. We shall all be changed. For what is mortal must, put, must be changed into what is immortal. What will die must be changed into what cannot die. So when this takes place and the mortal has been changed into the immortal, then the scripture will come true. Death is destroyed. Victory is complete. Where death is your victory? Where death is your power to hurt? Death gets its power to hurt from sin and sin gets its power from the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Pretty awesome words there. What about those who are still alive? What, what's going to happen to them? Up together yeah, with them and the we just read part of that, especially look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. Then who, we who are living at that time, Amen. see Paul still thought he would make it, <laughs> will be gathered up along with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Amen. So then encourage one another with these words. Okay, so when our week and feeble and mortal bodies are changed, what, what happens? Dennis, is that, is that yours? The living righteous are changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the voice of God, they, are, they were glorified. Now they are made immortal, and with the risen saints are caught up to meet their Lord in the air. Angels gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Little children are born by holy angels to their mother's arms. Friends long separated by death are united, never more to part, and with songs of gladness ascend together to the city of God. Uh, Ellen G. White, The Great Controversy, four, uh, 645. Well, once again, let's ask that question. At that point in time, will there be anything else that's more important and the second coming of Jesus Christ. No. Yeah. But for that yeah. to happen, something else has to become most important to us, yeah. and that's the message of Jesus. Yeah. It's really marvelous to think about this for a moment, realize that this is not an epilogue, the end of a story, it's not an appendix, it's not an afterthought of some kind. This is the grand climax, the great hope of the Christian's faith. The Christian story has a marvelous ending. And you notice we're not going to have a chance to talk about that today because we're not going to have time, but the book of Revelation 
you go through all these terrible things and awful stuff and you can't even figure out what in the world is going on and then you come to chapters 20 and 21 what does it talk about actually i'm sorry 21 and 22 new heaven and new heaven and new earth and mar a marvelous ending right well we adventists believe that we have two great books to teach us about god there's the book of nature we can look around us so we can see beautiful things we can see beautiful birds we have some good friends who went on a fabulous bird expedition down to Peru and took a bunch of pictures and made a calendar. And so I have in my study at home a calendar with these gorgeous birds that they took pictures of. I mean, colors and, oh man, you wonder how in the world did God design all that stuff? And how does he make it happen again and again? So but we, but there's some things we can't learn from nature. It, nature doesn't tell us about the second coming. It doesn't tell us about how to prepare. Uh, we need the revealed Word of God for that. So when we look at the revealed Word of God in the Bible, we learn about the Second Coming. And we learn about what, what plan God has for His faithful children to take them home to live with Him forever. In, con in, in context of that, in, in, in light of that, does the, do the ideas of evolution just seem silly? Yeah. Do you wonder why people choose to believe that we came essentially out of nothing? That we ultimately came from rocks? Hi. How was your grandfather rock? Oh, it's <laughs> and a few more generations yeah. back than that. A few more generations, yeah. Mil billions of years ago. Yeah. And that we will ultimately deteriorate and burn up or freeze up. Does that sound exciting? Are we living as if nothing else is as important as our relationship with Jesus Christ, especially when he comes a second time? Are we looking forward to seeing Jesus Christ face to face? What percentage of Seventh-day Adventists, if I dare ask it, are really thinking it'll be a wonderful time and are looking forward to seeing Jesus face to face? Anyone want to make a guess? I don't know. I think there's quite a few people in all churches, all Christian churches, who are saying, well, okay, we want him to come back, but not yet. Just mm -hmm. let us live our lives and so forth. And maybe, you know, they did, they did do a study, and they found out that most Christians want Jesus to come about five years after they die. Yeah. Well, so if that's the case, maybe the second coming isn't such a blessed hope. Well, I think it's the main reason to keep going. Mm -hmm. If the second coming is going to result in a, oh, and I guess we should look at that real quick, Second Peter three ten to thirteen, but the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Have you thought of God as being a thief? On that day, the heavens will disappear with a shrill noise, the heavenly bodies will burn up and be destroyed, and the earth with everything in it will vanish. So, what's going to happen with everything here on this earth? Village. Since all these things will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people should you be? Your life should be holy and dedicated to God as you wait for the day of God and do your best to make it come soon. The day when the heavens will burn up and be destroyed and the heavenly bodies will be melted by the heat. Wow. And we've already looked at Daniel 2, where it talks about the hand, that rock that's cut out without hands and it destroys the whole that entire statue and it just turns into dust that's going to be blown away like from a summer flesh threshing floor. Well, if the second coming is going to result in a fire so hot that it melts the very elements, and if the heavenly kingdom when it appears is to replace completely the old heavens and the old earth, then it should be clear that there is no relationship between the old and the new. Or is there? No. Mm. Not physically, at least. As we watch our world deteriorate around us and evil becomes more and more popular, isn't it becoming increasingly clear that the second coming and the replacement of all the evil of the, on this earth with good is what we need? Remember that there was no reason for Jesus to have come the first time if he does not intend to come back. 
So what emotions come up in your mind when you think about the second coming? Give you a moment to think about that, for, if you will. Well, most of us, many of us, have, have close relatives or friends that have passed away. Does it make it easier to live through that experience if we know that there's a second coming? Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, but on the other hand, if we in this earth do not appreciate a kingdom of pure love and look forward to a kingdom where there's pure love, I mean, how could we even want to go there unless yeah. we realize that it's something so different from anything we know here on earth? Yeah, exactly. And if we can't uh, appreciate the idea of a kingdom of love, we can't even begin to appreciate what heaven will be like. Yeah. Well, the most important and fundamental truth that should encourage all Christians is the truth about God, His character, and His government. When He comes again, we do not need to be afraid. The kind of God He is means that anyone who is in any possible way savable will be saved. Those will be the people who are looking forward to a kingdom of love, and they want to start it right now and right here on this earth. As a matter of fact, to them, it'll be, be nice. <laughs> yeah, uh, to them, I think uh, wanting to live that kind of life is even more important than going to heaven. Yeah. Well, I don't know about the rest of you, but I have observed over the years that there have been many discussions among Adventists about the fact that we know that Satan will try, will try to come first, pretending that he's Jesus, and, 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 and making us think that Jesus has come. Is there a way to know for sure when we see something like that happening that it's not the true Christ? Satan won't be, <coughs> pardon me, won't be allowed to do the magnitude of what happens to the sky when Christ comes. Well, there's some, there's some passages in, in, in the writings of Ellen White that give us some clear hints. Gordon, I think you have one. Desire of Ages, page 60. The wise men had, been, had seen a mysterious light in the heavens upon that night when the glory of God flooded the hills of Bethlehem. As the light faded, a luminous star appeared and lingered in the sky. It was not a fixed star, nor a planet, and the phenomenon excited the keenest interest. That star was a distant company of shining angels. But of this the wise men were ignorant, yet they were impressed that the star was of special import to them. Myra, you want to carry on there? This is from Christ's Object Lessons. He is coming with his own glory and with the glory of the Father. He is coming with all the holy angels with him. While the world is plunged in darkness, there will be light in every, living, in every dwelling of the saints. They will catch the first light of his second appearing. While the wicked flee from his presence, Christ's followers will rejoice. How many angels are going to be with him? Yeah, lots. All the holy angels. There's going to, heaven's going to be empty. Isn't there a verse in the Bible that talks about silence in heaven? Mm -hmm. Yes. I mean, if you're an angel, do you want to be there for this event? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah, you don't want to miss it. This is going to be oh. the, the, the event. But the angels were present at creation, too. Mm -hmm. And they're going to be present at that final coming of the Lord. Okay, Jim? Soon there appears in the east a small black cloud, about, the, about half the size of a man's hand. It is a cloud which surrounds the Savior and which seems to mm -hmm. distance, excuse me, seems in the distance to be shrouded in darkness. The people of God know this to be the sign of the Son of Man, in solemn silence, they gaze upon it as it draws nearer the earth, becoming lighter and more glorious, until it is the great white cloud, its base a gr glory like consuming fire, and above it the rainbow of the covenant. 
Jesus rides forth as a mighty conqueror, not now a man of sorrows to drink the bitter cup of shame and woe. He comes, victor in heaven and earth, to judge the living and the dead, faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. And the armies which were in heaven, Revelation 19, 11, and 14, follow him. With anthems of celestial melody, the holy angels, a vast num unnumbered throng, attend him on his way. The firmament seems filled with radiant forms, ten thousand times ten thousand and thousands of thousands. No human pen can portray the scene. No mortal mind is adequate to conceive its splendor. That's a great controversy, page 640. Okay, I want to assure everyone out there, if you understood we, those three passages we just read, when the real Jesus shows up, the entire sky is going to be full of bright, shining angels. Satan will never be able to duplicate the manner of Christ's coming. So if you can't see Jesus on his, on his throne seated there and the entire sky full of bright, shining angels, it's not the real Jesus. With the trumpet. And the trumpets, yeah, but that's, the trumpets will be just a small part of the show. So, when Satan comes, what will he do? He'll be on every television, probably, and people will say, well, there he is, right? Every eye will see him. Mm. Satan will never be able to duplicate the true manner of Christ coming. In other words, if the entire sky is full of bright, shining angels surrounding the throne with Jesus seated on it, we can know for sure that it's, it's what? It's the real Jesus. We've talked about this before, but let's, let's, let's re-emphasize it. Our church has a rather unusual name. What is the significance of being called Seventh-day Adventists? Connie? We worship the seventh day. Yeah. Okay. Which one over here? Our name. You have that there? Uh, 33. Where's mine? Number, number 33. Number 33. No. It's right there. Our name is made of two opposite entities. While the phrase seventh day connects us with earthly existence and human history, the word Adventist takes us to the future of history that comes after human history and belongs to the prophetic domain, pointing to the heavenly order. While the phrase seventh day confronts us with the present reality of the earthly city, and makes us breathe with, breathe with the rhythm of time under heaven. Ecclesiastes 3, 1. The word Adventist takes us away from here and makes us dream and pray and hope for the coming of the kingdom of heaven. It strengthens in our hearts this sense of eternity, excerpted from Jack Dukan. Mm -hmm. He wrote an article the, entitled The Tension, tension of Seventh-day Adventist Identity and existen Existential and Eschatological Perspective, okay. Journal of the Adventist Theology Society. Yeah, You've got to use those long words in there to I try know. to impress people. <laughs> I know <So>. him. <laughs> what? I know Jacques Ducan. Okay. <laughs> Is there an important connection between the events of creation and the Second Coming? Yes. What kind of connection? The connection is the foundation of the world, and that's mm -hmm. what we are uh, um, celebrating, the, the creation of the world. And then we are also hoping or, or waiting for this second coming of Christ. For the end of this for the world. End of, for the end okay. of this world, the beginning and then the end of this mm -hmm. world. Well, the Bible begins with the story of creation and, of course, ends in Revelation with the new heavens and a new earth in the kingdom of God. So what's connection between those what's the connection between those two? Well, for those of us who are faithful Seventh day Adventists and believe also in the writings of Ellen White, who help, helped us to read the Bible, we look that's the story of the Great Controversy, right? And when we have often said, especially in the past, we don't say it so much anymore, but we have said 
If you're a Seventh-day Adventist, you've accepted the third angel's message. What period of time is covered by the third angel's message? Yeah, Creation so. to Creation. second coming, right? Mm -hmm. Same story. Well, we have Christian friends who believe that the second coming of Christ will not be a literal, factual event, but rather an enhanced personal relationship with him, with their ethical lives, and their faith improving over time. What's an enhanced personal relationship? Well, something I hope we all have during this <laughs> yeah, life. Exactly. That's not where it's going to end. Are we all just going to get to be better Christians and that's what it's all about? The restoration of the image of God in man is not something that happens in an instant. Yeah. It's something that happens over a lifetime, and that's enhancing, of course, but that will also be the, the way we're going to vindicate the Word of God by living the kind of life Jesus came to teach us all about. Well, one Christian lecturer, believe it or not, mocked those naive Christians who believe in the literal second coming of Jesus from heaven. He said, do you think, well, Jesus will come on a parachute? Hmm. Uh, People laughed, and that indicates that the lecturer had made his point. True Christians are not dissuaded by such thinking. They know that God will cause a tremendous break in history, and ent an entirely new heavens and new earth will come. The prophecies of Daniel make it very clear that this final kingdom, which will last forever, is of a very different nature than the previous kingdoms of this world. Furthermore, Daniel 2.35 suggests that no trace of the former kingdoms will be found. And it is important to notice also that human beings will have nothing to do with the establishment of this final kingdom, Daniel 2.45. It is the God of heaven who sets up that final kingdom, Daniel 2.44. So where does that leave us? Well, education, the book of Education by Ellen White, page 145, paragraph 2. No scheme of business or plan of life can be sound or complete that embraces only the brief years of this present life and makes no provision for the unending future. Let the youth be taught to take eternity into their reckoning. So, in light of what we have studied, how much is going to change? Everything. 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 How quickly will the change come? If it's, you're talking about uh, us, that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, sure. we shall be changed. Exactly. Uh, but but there'll, it'll take a little, little more time to, for the earth to be cleansed. Yeah. Well, more than that, uh, we're going to be changed from mortal to immortal, mm -hmm. but we are going to grow for a thousand years. Yes. So that's, that's quite a growth that will take place. You know, Ellen White says something that I am pondered about recently. She says, Jesus will descend to this earth with the righteous before the New Jerusalem comes down. So they're going to be on this earth. And as you've just said, they're going to grow up during that thousand years. So here we're going to be, and all the wicked will be raised in what will be their condition? Like, like they went into the grave. Just the way they went into the grave. So imagine here's a group of people like Adam and Eve, 12, 15 people, 15 feet tall, walking around a bunch, uh, 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 among a bunch of pygmies like us, I wonder how that's gonna, gonna <laughs> seem, how that's gonna look. Well, maybe a little correction here because yeah. it's not to this earth that he's coming, it's the new earth. Well, that's also so true. So that's, a, even the earth will be created yeah. anew. Yeah. But is that gonna be before the second, before the, the, the New Jerusalem comes down or after it comes down? From what I understand and the readings I've done, it seems to be that uh, the Jerusalem, the new Jerusalem will come down on this earth, this new earth. Not this earth made new, but a brand new earth. Okay, well, there's a good possibility. Imagine the size of Jerusalem as it's described coming down on this earth. I don't think this earth could even support the weight of the new Jerusalem. Well, clearly, we're not dependent upon poor physical human ideas for our hope. 
our hope is firmly grounded on the God of the universe. He will come again with the clouds of heaven, Daniel 7, 13, Matthew 24, 30, and Revelation 14, 14. We cannot save ourselves. We have nothing to do, we had nothing to do with our births, and we have nothing to do with earning our salvation. Mm -hmm. It's interesting to note that the word end, E-N-D, in biblical Hebrew is ketz. It is derived from the Hebrew verb katsatz, which means cut off, Deuteronomy 25, 12. This implies what kind of an end? Abrupt. A very oh, yeah. abrupt end. Furthermore, this implies that God is coming to rescue his children from the hands of an enemy. Matthew 13, 28, and compare Job 1. We know what happened in Job 1, don't we? The second coming will be just as radical a change as when God rescued his people, his children from Egypt, or when he cast out demons from the demon possessed. Are we, going, are we all going to be surprised when the second coming happens? Well, if you read 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 6, which we don't have time to do right now, God's faithful people are not supposed to be surprised. They, they know what's going to happen. So what is God's plan for us? Again, unfortunately, we don't have a chance to read all of it, but Isaiah 65, 17 to 25 talks about that marvelous world where lions will lie down with lambs and leopards will cavort around with, with, with goats and so forth. God has marvelous things in mind for us. Second, I mean, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9 says, more, way beyond our wildest imagination, the plans that God has for us. There will be no death, no disease, no fear, no crying, nothing to disturb the peace or harmony of heaven. What God has in mind for us is, is just way out there. There's no, this is not to suggest that there's no way for us to even have any idea about heaven. Heaven is a real place. This is not a make-believe place. There are lots of strange beliefs about what will happen in the final events of this earth's history. While some people believe that things will gradually improve and Jesus will come down to the earth to rule over this earth from Jerusalem, we know that there's going to be a radical change. We believe that the day of the Lord will bring the total collapse and destruction of this world as we know it. But we can look forward with great hope to what we know is coming. Are we ready? Are you ready? Are you... Do you place the second coming of Jesus number one priority in your life? Our kind and wonderful Father, we are so thankful that we have this solid information about what's coming. It may, not be, it may be scary, it may not be fun, but we will, we will get through it and, and the reward you have on the other side is beyond belief. May it come soon is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.